In this lecture, we will look at what is known as the LU decomposition of a matrix A. The basic idea that we will pursue is to ask what happens if you want to try and solve AX equals B with multiple right-hand sides. Here's the main example that we are going to use for section one in this lecture. Basically, we have a matrix A and we do Gaussian elimination. And when I add a vector B to try and set this up to solve AX equals B, I don't have to redo the computations for A. I just have to update what happens to the B vector as I go from the original representation of B to the final representation once I've applied all the elimination steps to that B. If then I get a new vector B, well, I can just augment my matrix by that new vector B. And again, the only thing affected is the column that this vector is in. So we apply each of the Gaussian elimination steps to this new vector, and we can just keep going. Each time we add a new right-hand side, all we have to do is update B as we move down that stack of matrices. Algebraically, what we are doing, it might look a little more obvious. The first thing is I've taken my stack of matrices, my computational layout, and I've assigned names to those matrices. So I start with a matrix A and some right-hand side B. I find a matrix E1 and apply it to both A and B in order to put zeros in what was the original A matrix. Then we'll keep going with a matrix E2 all the way to a matrix EK. And by the time that we are done with Gaussian elimination, the matrix that's left is in a row echelon form. We'll call it U. And the B vector will have to be transformed into another vector by those same E matrices, and we'll call that vector Y. Algebraically, then, this is equivalent to saying that we start with AX equals B. We multiply in the matrix E1 on both sides, so it applies to both A and to B, and keep doing this until we have multiplied in all of our elimination matrices so that that product of elimination matrices times A is a row echelon form matrix that we'll call U, U for upper. Similarly, those very same matrices have been applied to B, and the final equation, therefore, is Ux is equal to, let's call it Y. So Gaussian elimination, therefore, takes a matrix A and whatever we augment it with, here with B, and applies those E matrices to arrive at an equivalent system, U x equals Y. And that final equation, U x equals Y, we solve by back substitution. So the way things went, therefore, we started with A, B, we applied Gaussian elimination to go to U, Y, and then once we have U, Y, we do back substitution. Now, let's try and modify this a little. The idea is, could we go directly from B to Y? And there are two approaches that come to mind. The first one is to simply keep track of that product of the E matrices. So let's call that cap E. So E is the product of all the matrices that we're applying to both A and B. And the result of applying that product of matrices to A is to obtain the row echelon form U, so EA is equal to U, and similarly applying that matrix E to B gives me the Y vector for UX equals Y. So what we are doing is we are trying to solve AX equals B by pre-computing that E and then applying E to B to get the Y vector and then solving our back substitution problem as before now, a second approach, which might not look as obvious at first, however, it will be the one that we will actually end up choosing, is to compute the inverse of E, to ask, how do I go from U back to A? E times A was equal to U, so if I multiply by the inverse of E, since all these individual E matrices are invertible, if I multiply by the inverse of E, I get A is equal to E inverse U. I get this particular matrix here. And similarly for B, B is E inverse times Y. 
And so when I want to solve ax equals b, I'll have to solve this second equation here for y, namely that e inverse y is equal to b. I know that e inverse matrix, if I pre-computed it, that with some unknown vector y is equal to my right-hand side b, solve that for y, and then I have my back substitution problem as before. So let's look at both of these. Let's look at pre-computing E first. And I'll use the example that we had before. If I look carefully at how this product is put together, I see that my E matrices multiply in, the non-zero column is in the rightmost position, then it starts shifting left, starts shifting left, and as we go, the first step, uh, that column just copies in. On the second step, the new column, well, at first it looks like it's copying in, but then the second position underneath the diagonal position has changed. It's no longer minus one, it's, this time it multiplied out to plus one. If I then go to the next column, well, the first two entries again copy in, but the remaining entries are actually changed. So there is this blue diagonal region that appears that I actually have to do computations for in order to get that matrix. When I compare this product to the original matrices, I see that I have to do some work. I have to compute some of these entries explicitly. And once I have that matrix, if I then think of it as applying to E times B, if I check how much work that is, it's the same work that I would be doing if I simply applied the individual matrices to B one step at a time. So I'll be doing some extra work if I use this idea of pre-computing the product of the E's. Namely, I have to compute those entries that appear below the second sub-diagonal. Let's look what happens if I try it the other way around. If I compute the inverse of E instead. Well, the inverse of E is e1 inverse e times e2 inverse times all the way to ek inverse. And I'll set up my multiplication in the exact same way. So here is i times e1 inverse, product times e2 inverse, the product times e3 inverse. And now when I check what happens with my multiplication, I notice something interesting. The first column copies in. Okay. Our matrix was the original I matrix, and now the first column has been replaced by the column of non-zero entries in matrix E1 inverse. The second matrix, the, now the column is column two. When I multiply the second matrix in, that second column gets copied down exactly. The first column is the same as before. Second column is this new column. The rest is still the I matrix. Go to the third equation and I find that the third column is copying it. And in fact, this pattern holds in general. In this order, when I have a single column of non-zero entries in my matrix of all ones on the diagonal identity matrix, except for this one column, if I go from filling in the first column, then the second column, then the third column in a product in this order, those columns just copy down. So there is no work that I need to do to actually write down the inverse of E. All it is, is to go from E1 to E1 inverse, I have to remember to change the signs underneath the diagonal one. And apart from that sign change, it's just copying the columns together. So columns fill in as we add columns from the left to right. And here is the thing. If I have a scaling matrix in that product, it's going to modify the inverses. It's going to be a little bit more work than just changing the signs. If I have a row exchange matrix in that product of the E's, it's going to mess up this nice pattern. It's going to mess up copying in one column at a time. So computing that inverse matrix E is going to be very, very easy when I don't do any scaling, that's a choice, but also when I don't do any row exchanges, and the row exchanges I may have to do. So that is not a choice. I just have to have a case where no row exchanges are required. The matrix that I end up with, the final matrix, look at its form. 
It's got ones on the diagonal and zeros above it. It is what is called a unit lower triangular matrix. It's composed of the product of the elementary matrices. It's an invertible matrix. And in the special case where I'm not doing any row exchanges, I'm going to call it L for lower. When we write down what we did, we had A is equal to this matrix times U. So we got a decomposition of A. We wrote it as a product of this unit lower triangular matrix L times our row echelon form matrix U. A is equal to LU. This is called the LU decomposition. Let's call it the theorem. If I start with a matrix A and I go to a row echelon form U by Gaussian elimination without doing row exchanges and without scaling, then I'll have found a decomposition of A as a product of L times U, where L is unit lower triangular and U is my row echelon form matrix. This decomposition is actually unique. The fact that we keep ones on the diagonal is what precludes any other possibility when we do these operations. So the inverse of L is just the product of the original elementary elimination matrices that reduce A to the row echelon form U. The inverse is very easy to get. It's just a sign change on the individual elementary elimination matrices, copying the columns together. But row exchanges and scaling would destroy that pattern. We can't use row exchange and scaling. What will happen is that E inverse would no longer be unit lower triangular. Summarizing then, let's see how to compute the LU decomposition. Here's my example again, this time without augmenting it by B, so my original A matrix. We do each of our Gaussian elimination steps until we are in row echelon form. At this point, we are going to check, did we do any scaling? Scaling would appear as a number on the diagonal of these matrices other than one. And if I check, no, each one of these matrices has one on the diagonal, so we did not do any scaling. Did we do any row exchanges? Well, row exchanges, again, would put a pattern of 0, 1, 1, 0 into these matrices. It would not have ones on the diagonal. So both of those conditions are met. We have done Gaussian elimination without row exchanges and without scaling. Once I have that, then what I have to do is to simply copy down each one of the columns of the matrices in my stack into a new matrix and then change the signs underneath the diagonal entries one. That sign change comes from the inverse of those individual matrices. So I now have my L matrix. It's always good to check. And since my L matrix is in the right position here, L times the row echelon form matrix U should come out as A. So if I multiply those two matrices together, I expect to see A as the product of these two matrices. And here I've actually carried out the check. Entries in purple here are indeed the original A matrix. Uh, one thing that that will catch is if you forget to change the signs underneath the diagonal. It's easy to do. So computation of LU, therefore, is Gaussian elimination as before, verifying that I haven't scaled and haven't exchanged rows, and then simply copying together the first, second, third column from the matrix as above, and proceed from there. Now, the book takes this a step further. It says, where do these columns come from? If I think back, how I got that column is I took my column with the pivot in it where I wanted to remove the entries. I changed each of the signs underneath the pivot and divided by the pivot. So the column over here is minus 1 divided by 1, plus 1 divided by 1, plus 2 divided by 1. And then when I take that column and I go down to the L matrix, I'll change those exact signs back again. The first column of L, therefore, I see in my A matrix as just take my pivot column over here and divide out the pivot. It's going to have 1 
minus 1, minus 2, underneath the diagonal entry 1. My second column over here comes from the second matrix. Again, it's the pivot, and all I have to do is divide out the pivot from the entries underneath to find what I have to put in the L matrix in the second column. Over here, the third column comes from this pivot over here. So divide out the pivot, that's 1 and 8 divided by 4 is 2, so 1, 2, and that's my third column in my A matrix. Any column I do not have, if I can stop early, because I'm in row echelon form already, would just fill in from the I matrix as before. It comes from that product of the inverses. Well, we have achieved the LU decomposition. Now the question remains, how can I use it? I want to solve AX equals B. So look at a first right-hand side B. What we have to do is we have to solve L times Y is equal to B, if you go back and check. Well, L Y is equal to B. L is this unit lower triangular matrix, and the first B vector in the first example was 2, 6, 8, 12. So here is my augmented system, L times Y is equal to B. Don't do Gaussian elimination on this matrix. We've already done the work. Just transcribe it. Look how it reads. The first row simply says that y1 is equal to 2. The second row is y1 plus y2 equals 6. But I already computed y1, so this gives me an equation for y2. Now I know y1 and y2. The next row is an equation involving y1, y2, and y3. So I can solve for y3. Now I know y1, y2, y3. I can go to the next equation and solve for y4. This equation, Ly is equal to b, unravels from the top down. Just like with ux equals y, we did back substitution. With Ly equals b, it's in the opposite order. We do forward substitution. So we simply transcribe the system, and of course we'll look at the matrix directly as before for speed. So we'll see that this equation here is y1 is equal to 2, y2 is equal to 6, minus y1, y3 is equal to 8, plus y1, minus y2, and y4 is equal to 12, plus 2y1, minus y2, minus 2y3. Putting this together, we find our y vector, 2, 4, 6, and 0. If I go back to my original system, originally the b vector was 2, 6, 8, 12, and by solving ly is equal to b, we found the y vector. We went directly from the b vector up at the first level to the final y vector. Then I find my row echelon form matrix, and at this point, all I have to do is go back to my back substitution, solve that final system as usual. Here it is, and let me quickly go back to the original problem. I have my row echelon form system, and the right-hand side is 2, 4, 6, 0, and I got it directly from the right-hand side, 2, 6, 8, 12. So let's see. 2, 6, 8, 12 to 2, 4, 6, 0 in one step by solving Ly equals B. So we'll do our back substitution. We have identify our free variable, x3 equals alpha, x5 equals beta, and solve the system from the bottom up and finally put the solution in our standard form, our particular solution for that right-hand side B, plus the homogeneous solution, the solution of AX equals zero. The algorithm then is quite simple. It's write our system AX equals B in the form LU times X equals B. I don't know the vector X, so a priori I don't know the vector u times x, so let's give that a name, we'll call it y. So l times y is equal to b, where we've set ux equal to y. So we solve l y equals b by forward substitution, and ux equals y, plug that y into that second equation, and solve that by back substitution. So once I've achieved my lu decomposition, if I get another right-hand side coming in, well, We'll set up our Ly equals B for that new right-hand side. So the second right-hand side in the example above was 2, 6, 7, 10. Solve it by forward substitution. So just unravel it from the top down. 
and now we have our standard problem uh, we have to do the back substitution again but the one thing that's slightly different is i've already computed the homogeneous solution right? i already know what that part of the solution is i don't have to recompute it so what i'm going to do instead is i'm going to set the three variables equal to zero that's going to get rid of the homogeneous solution and just leave me with the particular solution that i'm after so set x3 equals 0, x5 equals 0 in our back substitution algorithm, and then do back substitution as usual to get our new solution. Of course, checking our solution is the same as before. The particular solution has to solve a x equals b, so we can simply plug it into our original equation to check that indeed we get the right hand side. And each of the vectors in the homogeneous solution has to satisfy a x equals 0, so we can plug those in at once and make sure that indeed we have the right solution. So we have reorganized the computations for solving AX equals B by Gaussian elimination. We've simply computed a product of the inverses of those elimination matrices, and that was simply a copying step, and done the same problem as before, going directly from the b vector to the y vector without computing any of the intermediate values. Now this works if we don't have to do any row exchanges. So the question is, what if we have to do a row exchange? It's not a choice. That leads to a slight variation of this LU decomposition. It's called the PLU decomposition. Let's see what happens with an example. The problem is I got a matrix A and I'm trying to do Gaussian elimination and I find I have a row exchange I need to do. Well, introductory linear algebra texts tend to instruct you to say, well, if I had interchanged the rows of A to begin with, I wouldn't have that problem. So interchange the rows of A and take that new matrix with the rows interchanged and just start over. Well, it's doing a lot of duplicate work, and it's very easy to avoid. So let's not do that. Let's look at how to avoid the problem, how to use what we've already done. So here's an example where I've started with a matrix A, and I do my Gaussian elimination as before. So here's my pivot 1, eliminate underneath that pivot, pivot 11, eliminate underneath that pivot. And now I'd like a pivot at position 3, 3, but that's 0. But I have a perfectly good pivot underneath, so I need to do a row exchange. Here is the row exchange matrix happening. That pulls the 3 up above, and now I'm back in my normal Gaussian elimination routine. So take that value 3, eliminate below. Well, there's nothing to be done. It's already 0. A shift to the 1, make that our next pivot, and eliminate below. And we are done with Gaussian elimination at this point. Now, if I try and look at what happens with the L matrix, I'll need to write that underneath. So the first column is going to be 1 minus 2 plus 1 plus 2 minus 1. So copy that in. Here's that first column. Copy in the second column, uh, 0, 1, 0, 2, 3. That would work. But then comes a row exchange. And when I multiply my inverse matrices together to do this copying together step, that third matrix the row exchange matrix messes things up. I have ones above the diagonal and zeros on the diagonal as a consequence. That product of the inverses is no longer unit lower diagonal. So something has to give here. So let's investigate a little bit why this happens. When we multiply things out, we see the following. E inverse, well, E1 inverse was a matrix with a single column of entries to put zeros in. That one works. E2 inverse also was a matrix with a single column of non-zero entries. So when I multiply those first two matrices together, I indeed copy down the columns as before. But then comes the P matrix. The P matrix would mess things up, so let's leave it out. And the remaining matrices I could again multiply together. Well, there's only a single matrix, so it's just this one matrix over here. So the piece on the left that doesn't have any row exchanges in it, works as before. The piece on the right that doesn't have any row exchanges in it also works as before. It's this row exchange matrix P in the middle that's creating the problem. Now, what we'll try and do is 
imitate what the introductory texts say, namely, if only I had applied P to the original matrix A, it would have worked. So that raises the question, can I take this P and somehow push it to the other side? Can I pull it toward the equal sign? Of course, that will change that matrix in between, since matrix products are not commutative in general. But let's see how I might be able to do that. I want to push that P to the left, toward the equal sign. So what happens is, well, I'll write the E3 inverse matrix as P for a row exchange. And the matrix on the left that I already have, I'll simply call E tilde. So what I have here is E tilde times P times the third matrix. Let's just look at E tilde times P. So E tilde times P, I'd like to rewrite it as push the P to the other side. So P times a new matrix. Let's call it E hat. And realize that, wait a second, P is invertible. The row exchange, I can just apply to itself uh, a second time and it will undo the row exchange. It's uh, its own inverse. So multiply through by the row inverse to solve for E hat. E hat, therefore, is P inverse times that E tilde matrix times P. And P inverse uh, for a single row exchange is P again. So all I have to do is take this matrix to the left of P and multiply it from both left and right by P. And then I can put P on the other side. So let's break this down into two steps. Let's look at what P inverse does to E tilde first. So compute P times E tilde, and then look at what happens to that result when I apply P on the right afterwards. So let's look at P E tilde first. What we see when we do that computation is that the two rows that we wanted to exchange, namely P was exchanging rows three and four, are indeed getting exchanged. But in so doing, the pattern of ones on the diagonal is broken. I now have this matrix 0, 1, 1, 0 sitting where I expected 1, 0, 0, 1. So indeed, E does mess up our nice pattern. But here is what happens when I multiply that matrix with that displaced set of ones by P on the other side. It puts those ones back in place. So what we do, therefore, when we apply that transformation to P, what we have to do, if we look back here, P wants to exchange rows 3 and 4. When we push P to the other side, we exchange rows 3 and 4, and then we fix up the patterns of 1s again. We keep the 1s on the diagonal. And once we've done that, the next matrix again is the right pattern to just copy in its columns as before. The end result is that we have a product of E inverses, and any time we encounter a P matrix, we simply push it to the front. If there's more than one row exchange matrix, I'll get a product of row exchange matrices sitting in front. I will get a general permutation matrix sitting in front. For our example then, again, to see how it works, we started out with a matrix, a row exchange of rows three and four, and another elimination matrix as before that uh, satisfies the pattern, we push the P to the other side. That P was interchanging rows 3 and 4. In so doing, we interchange rows 3 and 4, but then we fix up the patterns of the ones again. Once I have that, the next matrix is again in the right shape to simply multiply in, so that will simply copy that next column into the matrix as before, and I'll end up with P, times a unit lower triangular matrix times an L matrix times U. So I end up with P L U. For the cases where I didn't need to do any row exchanges, that P would be equal to the identity matrix, I L U. Now, how do we use to solve it? Well, we start out with AX equals B, and we manage to decompose A into P L U. So if I plug in, I see P L U X equals B. I don't know the X, and therefore I don't know U X, and I don't know L times U X. So I'll give L U X a name, I'll call it W. And so the first equation I have to solve is P W equals B, 
And after that, I'll have LUX equals W as before. That's my forward backward substitution problem as before. And PW equals B is a permutation on the W's equals B. This actually is trivial. It simply says reorder the entries in B according to what that matrix P is telling us to do. There are a number of variations to the PLU decomposition. One of them is the PLDU decomposition. Basically, what I can do is if I have a row echelon form matrix like here with pivots 2, 3, and 6, I can try and pull the pivots out. I'll write my pivots into a matrix here, 2, 3, 6, and then, of course, I have to undo that if I want to multiply it in. I'll write the inverse of it right next to it, so that matrix of pivots times its inverse times the original row echelon form matrix, and then we'll take that inverse and multiply it in, so we are actually scaling the pivots to 1. So we are ending up with a diagonal matrix, the D matrix, times a row echelon form matrix with ones on the diagonal, and we'll call it U again. It's a row echelon form matrix. So from the original U, we end up with D times U. And when we do that in our PLU decomposition, we end up with the PLDU decomposition instead. We'll have achieved a split of the matrix A into a permutation matrix, a unit lower triangular matrix, a diagonal matrix, and a row echelon form matrix. Now, the PLU decomposition is not unique. LU was unique. There's only one way to obtain LU because we are insisting on ones on the diagonal. With PLU, well, we are free to do partial pivoting. So we are free to put any kind of row exchange in that we care to as we go along in our Gaussian elimination step. So there are many PLU decompositions for a given matrix A. The other special case I want to show you is what happens with symmetric matrices. If my symmetric matrix has an LU decomposition, so it doesn't require row exchanges, then what I can do is I can use the LDU decomposition. I can pull the pivots out of that U. And in that case, what I find is something interesting. The remaining U matrix is actually the transpose of the L matrix. So if I don't need to do any row exchanges on my symmetric matrix, when I do my LDU decomposition, I get LD, L transpose. Now, this is worth writing it as a theorem. So let A be a symmetric matrix. And what happens is A equals LD, LT exists if and only if A has an LU decomposition. That is, if and only if A can be reduced to row echelon form without row exchanges. If you have to do a row exchange, there is no way of writing that matrix A in this form. So, for example, a very simple matrix where you can't do it is the matrix here, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0. No matter what you try, you can't put it in that form. You need to do a row exchange to get this matrix into row echelon form. Our takeaway for today, we have taken the matrix A, and we found that we could decompose it into a product of the form PLU, where P is a permutation matrix, L is a unit lower triangular matrix, and hence invertible matrix, and U is a row echelon form matrix. The PLU decomposition actually resulted simply by reordering the computations in Gaussian elimination. So it's just Gaussian elimination in disguise. And if you look for codes to do Gaussian elimination on the web, you won't find too many hits when you look for Gaussian elimination. But if you look for the LU decomposition, uh, you will find many a code that does Gaussian elimination. The solution of AX equals B using the PLU decomposition is simply the forward-backward algorithm. Now, when we do Gaussian elimination, we don't need to do any row exchanges then that P matrix is simply equal to I. We get the decomposition A is equal to LU. And the one special case, when I do Gaussian elimination and I don't need row exchanges for a symmetric matrix, if I pull the pivots out of the row echelon form matrix, 
I end up with A is equal to L times D times L transpose.